Well, good morning, everyone. It is uh, nice for you to be listening. I wish I could say I could see you all here today, but I cannot. But I trust that this is beaming into your homes and in a place where it will be clear and that you'll be able to be blessed of God by hearing the, the word of God being preached and proclaimed today. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll get started. Our Father, we do love you. We thank you, God, for your love to each one of us. We thank you for the ladies that are going to sing here in a moment. And Lord, we pray that the, the singing would lead us as a congregation in worship. And Lord, that that worship would rise to you a sweet, fragrant aroma this morning. We do uh, pray, Father, for our countrymen, those who are suffering from this uh, virus. We pray, God, that you would be an encouragement to them, that you'd touch and heal them. We pray, Father, for the doctors and nurses, that you'd give them an extra portion of wisdom as they minister to those people's physical needs. We do pray, Father, for ourselves, that, that God, that you'd anoint us with your spirit, that you'd give us good insight into your word this morning, and we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. is 
is Christ in me. Lord, I need you. Teach my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way and when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay and when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay that formed the washing grass takes the blood of Jesus feel the earth is shaking now see the veil is split in two and he stood before the wrath of God shielding sinners with Tomb today, death could not 
sustain him once the servant of the world now in victory reigning lift your voices to the one who is seated on the throne see him in the new jerusalem praise the down through verse 10. It's in the Old Testament. If you're looking for it, it's in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, and there you go, 1st and 2nd Chronicles. Go to 1st Chronicles chapter 4, and I've entitled the message this morning, A Little Prayer with a Big Prize. It's about a man, I believe, that was feeling a little bit discouraged, a fellow named Jabez, and he prayed this little prayer but it had a huge prize. Before we dig into that passage of scripture, I once again was looking in this uh, prayer book or this devotional book entitled God's Promises for When You Are Hurting. And I came to one that was entitled Discouraged. And I think maybe just like Jabez, maybe some of us in our day and time, because we're, we're here and we're in our homes and we've got this virus going around our country, it can be a time of discouragement. And so this little devotion reads like this with some related verses. Whenever God allows you to experience more demands, setbacks, and even pain than you think you can handle, it is easy to become overwhelmed and find yourself discouraged. Why even get up in the morning when the burdens are so heavy and the path ahead unclear? Because in seasons like these, you can experience the bittersweet closeness of your heavenly Father who will enable you by his power and his presence to stand strong in every trial and to navigate every tribulation. He has been faithful through the ages. He is faithful now, and he will be your strength whatever problems you face. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 6 and 7, it says this, Greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise and honor and glory to the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having, whom having not seen, you love. In Psalms chapter 138, verses 7 and 8, it says this, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand will save me. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the works of your hands. And in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, Jesus said, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Again, in John chapter 14, our Lord said in verses 1 down through verse 3, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And then in John chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, it says this, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, Be confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. 
And finally, in Psalms chapter 31, verses 23 down through verse 24, it says this, Love the Lord, all you godly ones, for the Lord protects those who are loyal to him, but he harshly punishes the arrogant. Be so be strong and courageous, all you who put your hope in the Lord. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll dive right in to 1 Chronicles chapter 4. Father, again, we want to tell you that we love you. We thank you, God, for your love to us. We thank you, God, that you have your protective hands all wrapped around us. We pray now, Father, as, as we listen to the word of God, that, Lord, that you would anoint us with your spirit, that, Father, that you'd have free movement amongst all of us out there, all over cyber land that's out there listening to this today. We believe, Father, that all the people that are listening are listening by divine appointment. And God, we pray that you would speak to them clearly. We pray, our Father, that you'd give them ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart that's open and ready to receive all that you have for them today. We pray, Father, if there are lost people that are listening, that they would hear the gospel and be saved this morning. And Father, we pray for Christians that are listening, that God, that they would take to heart the things that they hear, that they'd apply these things to their life, that they might experience miracles around them all the time. And we'll praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. A little prayer with a big prize. First Chronicles chapter 4, verses 9 down through verse 10. It's about a man named Jabez. And I suppose if you read the Bible, and I imagine that all of you, all of you good Christian people read the Bible through all the time, at least once a year, maybe more often than that. And when you come to the book of First Chronicles and you start reading, sometimes you just pass it right over from First chapter all the way to the ninth chapter because it's one name after another, names of people that you don't know who they are, names that are difficult to understand. All of that's in Chronicles, so it's our, our just, it would be something in us that would say, let's skip this. Let me just read a few of those names for you to give you a little flavor of that. Starting in the first chapter, in verse 1, it says, Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalo, Jared, Enoch, Maluth, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah, Sham, Ham, Japheth. The son of Japheth were Gomer, Magog, Medai, Javan, Dubal, Meshach, Meshach, and Tyaz. And it just keeps going. One verse after another all the way through nine chapters all the way to the first part of chapter 10. But in the middle of that, in the middle of that, in chapter 4, the Lord gives up two verses. He's the only place, the only break there is all the way through this chronology. And it talks about a man. And it pauses for those two verses. I'd like to read those verses to you. It says, Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. And his mother named him Jabez, saying, Because I bore him with pain. Now Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed, and enlarge my border, and that your hand might be with me, and that you would keep me from harm, that it might not pain me. And God granted him what he requested, and the genealogies take right off again and run all the way through chapter 9 and take us right to the beginning of chapter 10. It is that little prayer, that man, that I would like us to take a look at this morning. In verse 9, it says, Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. I think all of us want to be more honorable, don't we? I think every single one of us would want to be honored before God. Someday all of us one day are going to stand before God. We come to the end of this life, we're going to stand before Jesus. And we want to hear from him, well done, my good and faithful servant, enter in to my presence. I believe all of us want to hear that. We want to be honorable like Jabez was honorable. And here God paused under the inspiration, or the writer, excuse me, paused under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and mentioned this Jabez and said that he was more honorable than all of his brothers, all of his siblings. He was more honorable than all of them. Why was that? Why was he more honorable than them? Because he prayed. And not just because, I think his siblings, they also prayed. But he prayed this prayer that made a tremendous impact, not only in his life, but makes an impact down through the ages and can truly make an impact in your life here this morning. Let's look at again verse 9. And Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. And his mother named him Jabez, saying, Because I bore him in pain. Now the name Jabez, his name means pain. Literally pain. Or may cause pain. It's like, not like the golfer Payne Stewart where you'd spell it P-A-Y-N-E. No, this is P-A-I-N-E. She named him Payne. Can imagine that? All of his life, from the time he was a little boy, all the ribbing that he must have took because of that. Here comes that little pain. Here's a pain in the neck. Here's a pain in the back. Here's a pain in the butt. Here comes that little pain. And teased by his peers, they're around about him. And now he's growing up, and people are still calling him Jabez Payne. Why did she name them that? It says, because I bore him in pain. 
I don't know what happened to her. I don't know if she was having a hard time giving birth or if the baby was breached or what the problem was. Maybe her husband had died and she had all kinds of little bowels to feed. And now here's one more. And because of that, she named him pain because I bore him in pain. I don't know why she named him pain, but she did. She named him pain and it's going to come up in his prayer because names mean a lot. They mean a lot of stuff in the Old Testament. A person had a name, and that name would characterize his life. And so he's looking at himself, and he's saying, man, my mother named me pain. This could characterize my whole life. I could be pain. They could look at me and say, here is that pain in the neck that's coming here. Again, verse 9, Jabez was more honorable than his brothers, and his mother named him Jabez, saying, because I bore him in pain. Verse 10, now Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, oh, that you would bless me need. I want you to point out something to you. There are four prayer requests to this prayer. The first one is that God would bless him indeed. Secondly, that he would enlarge his borders. Thirdly, that his hand might, that God's hand might go before him. And the fourth one, that God would keep him from harm, that it might not, there it is, that it might not pain him. He didn't want to be characterized by pain. And so he wanted God to keep him from harm so it would not pain him. And I believe to pain others. But we'll get into that as we get going along. Look at verse 10 again. Jabez called on the God of Israel saying, oh, that you would bless me indeed. The word bless is an interesting word. And it's a word I, I think that is uh, taken down in our time, belittled actually in our time. We say it so much about other things it kind of loses its grip and its meaning, don't we? we? We say bless the kids, bless the missionaries, bless the food, bl bless the preaching, bless if, you're, if you sneeze, your grandma's going to say, bless you, God bless you when you sneeze. It's said over and over and from pulpits all across our land today. There will be preachers, no doubt, preaching just like I am, shooting out into, super, into cyberspace saying, God bless you, bless. And so we demean that word. We put that word down a little bit, but it has a powerful meaning in the Bible. Bless me. To bless in the biblical sense means to ask for or to impart supernatural favor. I think that's what Jabez was asking for. He was asking that God would endow him, that would anoint on him with supernatural favor. When we ask God's blessing, we are not asking for more of what we can get for ourselves. We are crying out for the wonderful, unlimited goodness that only God has power to know about or to give. This kind of richness is, is what the writer in, was referring to in the book of Proverbs in chapter 10 in verse 22 where he said, and I quote, the Lord's blessing is our greatest wealth. All our works add nothing to it. Let me give that to you again. The Lord's blessing, that supernatural favor, that supernatural endowment that comes upon a person is our greatest wealth, the greatest thing that we can get from God, and in all our works add absolutely nothing to it. So no matter what we can do, whether we can stand and preach or sing or witness or go and read the Bible and study and teach people, all of that is nothing alongside of this great blessing that God gives this supernatural favor and that's exactly what Jabez was crying out for that kind of supernatural favor and he's not the only one throughout the Bible we find other people crying out for a blessing of God remember when Jacob wrestled with God wrestled with him all night long and would not let him go and the Lord touched his hip and his ship came out of joint and the Lord said let me go and he said I will not let you go until you bless me until you impart that supernatural favor upon me Jabez left it entirely up to God to decide what the blessing would be and where and when and how he would receive it. He didn't ask for a particular blessing. He just asked that God would bless him. And I would say to you that God wants to bless you. And he wants to bless you really big. He wants to give you a great, big, spirit-filled, powerful anointing of his power and his spirit. He wants to bless you in a big way. Is it okay? Is it okay for us to ask God for a blessing? Oh, I believe it is. Look at that verse again. It says, now Jabez called on the God of Israel and saying, oh, that you would bless me indeed. That little word indeed means big. That God, that you would bless me really big. Jabez was saying to God, I don't want no penny any blessing. I want some great, big, imparted, supernatural power that would fall upon me and in my life. That's what he's asking for. Is it okay for you to ask for such a thing as that? Yes, it is. It may sound a little arrogant. It may sound a little presumptuous on our part, but God wants to bless you. 
And, and the reason we don't have it is because we don't ask for it. The Bible says, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be un opened unto you. And the only reason we don't have it is because we don't ask. Ask, he says, and it shall be given to you. Man, we need to ask for God's blessing. That great, big, spirit-filled, powerful, spiritual atonement that God wants to lay upon us. When Moses said to God on Mount Sinai, show me your glory in Exodus chapter 33 and in verse 18, he was asking for more intimate understanding of God. In response, God said, described himself to him. He said, the Lord, the Lord our God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in truth, Exodus chapter 34 and verse 6. It's incredible, isn't it? It's amazing. The very nature of God is to have goodness in so much abundance that it overflows into our worthless lives. But that's what we're asking for. We're asking for that kind of spiritual, supernatural favor that comes from God. God's bounty is limited only by us, by us, not by his resource or power or willingness to give. Jabez was blessed simply because he refused to let any obstacle, person, or opinion loom larger than God's nature. And God's nature is to bless. God wants to bless you, and he wants to bless you big. That's what Jabez was praying for, and that's what you and I ought to be praying for as well. I have been praying the prayer of Jabez now for 19 years, and I've seen God's blessing come so much so that I can hardly contain all that the Lord has been doing around me. If you want to have miracles in your life, then you must be people that pray that God would bless you and that he would bless you indeed, that he would bless you big. And then he goes on, second request, and enlarge my borders. Jabez grew up in a time where the nation of Israel, the land had been conquered, Joshua had been in and conquered, and had been divided up all amongst the people of Israel. And he had a portion of land, but he knew if he was going to really be able to do something big for God and big for his family, he needed an enlarged border that he might be able to do more for the Lord. Well, how does that apply to us? Do we pray that God would give us more property? No, but we ought to be praying that God would give us a bigger plate, that we might be able to do more for God, that God would enlarge our border, that he'd give us a bigger plate that we, and I believe it's in every one of our hearts, to want to do more for the Lord. And it, we what you want to do that. And so we need to ask God for a bigger plate that we might be able to do more, that would lift him up, that would glorify him, that would strengthen his kingdom as we go ahead. Bless me indeed, enlarge my border, that, and that your hand would go before me. I think Jabez, he understood that if God's supernatural power came upon him, that, that favor that God was laying on him in this blessing, and if he got an enlarged border, if he was able to do more for God, that he couldn't do that on his own. If he was trying to muster up this blessing or muster up what he could do by God on his own, in his own power, it would fail. But if God's hand would go before him, it could not fail. All of us need to have that same strength in our heart to say that, oh, God, bless me. Bless me big. Give me a great, big, huge blessing. Lord, give me a bigger plate that I might be able to do more for you. And Lord, you go ahead of me. Let the Lord plow the snow for you. Let the Lord get out there and do these great things before you because if I try to do it, then it'll be all messed up and it'll fail. But if God tries to do it, does it, nothing can stop what the Lord is doing. Bless me indeed, enlarge my border, and that your hand would be with me, and that you would keep me from harm, that it might not pain me. The little word harm is an interesting word. It's a word that could be translated evil. I think that's what Jabez is praying for. Lord, keep me from the evil one. Keep me from the devil. Keep the devil from me and me from the devil. God, keep him away from me. And I think he knew that if God enlarged his border, if his hand was out there in front of him, if he was experiencing the blessing, that the devil was not going to sit still and he would attack him. And so he's asking God to keep him safe from him. And all of us need to do the same thing, don't we? We need to cry out to God and ask God to wrap his strong, omnipotent arms around us, that he would put his strong, omnipotent hands around us. And that he would keep us from sin because sin causes pain in our life, doesn't it? If you sin, it pains you. If you sin and your family knows about it, it's going to pain your family. If we sin in our country, it pains our country. If we sin in a church, it pains our church. And so we need to pray that God would wrap his strong, omnipotent arms around us and keep us from the devil and the devil from us, that he would be our front guard and rear guard and side guards, that he would just hold us tight in his arms. And then this last sentence of this verse, and God granted him what he requested. Isn't that something? He prayed that those pray 
four things, that God would bless him indeed, that God would enlarge his border, that his hand would go before him, that he would keep him from the evil one, and God granted him request. That's why he was more honorable than everybody else. Now, has that been the case in your life? It has been in mine, and I want to just share some testimony with you. I've been praying this prayer for 19 years. 19 years ago, I received this little book entitled The Prayer of Jabez by Bruce Wilkerson. In the flyleaf of this thing, it was given to me as a gift, and it writes this. The person wrote this to Pastor Markham from Dixie, Julie, and Lynn, January 2001. We wanted to pass on this special little book to you as a token of our deep appreciation for your consistent love and attention to mother and daddy. That would be Roland and Irma Peterson, their mother and daddy. They gave me that book, and I started reading that book, and I was it stirred in my heart. And so I went to First Chronicles, and I was reading this and doing my own personal study on it, and God started doing some great things in my life, and I started praying this prayer, the prayer of Jabez. And I have seen God answer that prayer in my own life, and he can answer that prayer and will answer that prayer in your life. I can remember when I first came here, I started praying it a year before I came here, and it was like God said, you want a blessing? I'll give you a blessing. I'm going to pull you out of here, out of Elkhorn, and I'm going to enlarge your border. I'm going to send you up to Pequot Lakes. And so God sent me up here. I went in obedience to his call. I had a clear call from his word to come up here, and here I am. And God has been blessing now for all these 18 years. I remember when I first got here, I, I went out in the community. I was not called to be the senior pastor. I had the great honor of sitting at the feet of the senior pastor that was here then. His name was Mark Whittemore. And I said at his feet, I believe he is one of the finest Bible teachers I've ever sat under. And so when he got sick and I became the senior pastor, I entered into his work. And the reason that things are going good now is because we entered into that man's work and God is doing a great thing. And I've been praying this prayer. When I first got here, I was the pastor of discipleship and evangelism. And I thought, well, if that's what I am, then I better get in town and meet some people. So I went into Pequot Lakes and I went to every single store every place in town. I met every teller that was there. I shook the hand of every manager and owner if I could find an owner, and I talked to them, told them what I was about, that I was a new pastor at the Pequot Lakes Baptist Church, that I came to be the pastor of discipleship, to encourage people to live right for the Lord, and to be a pastor of evangelism, to reach out to people's lives and tell them about Jesus so they could have eternal life. I went through the whole town. It took me a whole week to knock on every single store and talk to all those people. In one week, I made that, I got that accomplished. And when I was done, I've got to admit, it was a little bit discouraging because I didn't win anybody to the Lord. I thought, surely, if I would go out and do that to everybody, sooner or later, somebody would surely ask about Jesus and I could lead them to the Lord, but it didn't happen. And I was sitting in my office thinking about that, and I got a phone call from a person I never met ever in my life. He was a, a man, never have, still have never met him. And he called me up, and he said that he had a friend in Pine River, a guy by the name of Dan Comerford, and he said he would want him, he witnessed to Dan, and Dan wouldn't, did not receive the Lord, and he wondered if I would go in and see him, and he gave me the address of where he was staying. He was a brand new guy in Pine River, and so I went up there, and I was right across the street from Champ's Meat Market, and uh, there was a m little motel, and I went to the room, and I knocked on the door, and I heard him get up in there grunting and groaning, and then he opened the door, and there stood a giant of a man. He must stand six, 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 seven. He was huge. He had a big pop belly, and his eyes were popping out of his head, and snooze was running out of the sides of his mouth. And I thought, oh, my Lord, what have you got me into now? And I sat down, and within 15 minutes, Dan received the Lord as his Savior, and it forever changed his life. Dan became such a warrior for the Lord. Now, he's not a, a Sunday school teacher or a deacon. He's never going to go to Bible college or anything like that, but he took up a ministry. He went down to the home there in Pine River, and he started playing board games with elderly people and card games with elderly people. He'd put them in their wheelchairs and wheel them all around, give them a tour of the place. When it was nice outside, he took them outside for walks. It changed Dan's life. It changed him forever. And shortly after that, I got in a Bible study here. I had a three-lesson Bible study, outlines that I did with people. And uh, I had a Bible study in the home of a man named Joe Anderson. And I led Joe, on the third study, I led Joe to the Lord. Joe has been just a tremendous man of God. He is living for the Lord. He's now one of our newest deacons in our church. Actually, he is the newest deacon in the church. He, he was a single man. He raised his two children, and they both love the Lord and are living for the Lord. And his daughter has gone off to Bible college. Joe has done all kinds of different Bible studies with people. He's worked with our youth group and was the youth group director and done a slam-bang job of that. 
Is that not God blessing? Is it when Dan gets saved, Joel gets saved, God pouring out his blessing upon us? Isn't he expanding our border? I've prayed this not only for myself, but for you as a church. It wasn't like, and I could testimony after testimony in over these 18 years of people that I've talked to and received that have received the Lord. I think of one where there was a lady that came into my office. I was in the office down at the other end of the building in the Trailside Center, and she knocked on my door. I'd never seen her before in my life, and I opened up the door, and I said hi, and she introduced herself, and she said she wanted to know something about Jesus. In 15 minutes, we sat down in my office, and in 15 minutes, she received the Lord as her Savior. And I tell you, there's sometimes I've witnessed to people, and you wonder if they're catching it. But there are other times I've witnessed people, and this is the case of this lady. It was like scales were on her eyes, and they were falling off of her eyes. And the more I talked, the more she got a hold of it. And by the time she left my office, if there would have been a cloud outside, she had been walking on top of that cloud. Her life was forever changed. Now, she wasn't a resident of Pequot Lakes. She was just kept passing through town. She said she was from someplace over on the other side of Aiken. And I've never heard from her since, but I know that the Lord touched her life and changed her forever. I think there are stories, like I said, story after story of that. Bring us up a little bit closer to time. My niece, Mary, she, she was a bartender down here, is a bartender, and, and uh, she'd come and listen to me preach a few times, and she told her brother, Tom, she says, you need to come down and listen to your Uncle Mike preach. And Tom came to church here. I don't know if he came out of respect for his own dad, my brother who had passed away, or if he came just out of curiosity to hear me, but I believe for all for sure that Tom came with a divine appointment from the Lord himself. I preached that morning. Tom came forward and got saved. I, his wife got saved a little later on. I baptized him. I baptized his wife. He's got two wonderful kids. He's a business owner in our, in our town and a, a great man of God. Has a Bible study on Saturday mornings with young people. Has for over a year now, and God is really blessing that. Is that not God pouring out his blessing upon us? Is he not expanding our borders? Isn't his hand going before us to see all of those things taking place? And let me tell you a story about a, a young fellow that, that stayed with Diane and I, my wife and I. His name is Philip. He was a foreign exchange student. He came to our, our city, and, and he was with a family, and something happened in that family. I don't know what it was, but anyway, he could not stay with them. And, and it was either find somebody to take him in, or he was going to be shipped back to Germany. And Diane came home, gave me this big sob story about this young fellow, this teenage kid. And I said, Diane, come on. You know, what's two old people? What are we going to do with a teenager in our home? And we don't know what this kid is like at all. But I caved in, and we took him. And I can remember when Diane brought him home. I was sitting out on my back deck in the sun. It was a nice fall morning or afternoon. And he came up, and he shook my hand, and he introduced himself, and I introduced myself. And he said, and he asked me, he says, what do you do for a living? I said, well, I'm a preacher. Oh, he says, I don't go to church. I said, well, if you're going to live with me, you're going to go to church. And he said, well, it's not that we don't go to church. It's just that the only time we go to church would be like Christmas or Easter, maybe when somebody got married or somebody died, but his family just didn't go. But he just submitted, and he came to church with us. And he would come in and listen to me preach, and I told him, you need to go to Sunday school. But he wouldn't go to Sunday school. He sat out there in the fellowship hall and played his little board games on his computer, and a girl kept coming up to him, Allie Anderson, kept coming up to him and encouraging him to come to, to, uh, to Sunday school with her. And she just kept after him, kept after him, and finally he submitted, and he went to Sunday school, and he became one of the leaders in that youth group. And I had the honor of leading him to the Lord and baptizing him. He went back to Germany from here, right? A kid that got saved from here went back to Germany with the gospel. I mean, is that not expanding our border? Is that not God blessing us in a big way, expanding our border and sending off a missionary from our church to Germany, our own people? And it happened again this year. Oh, not in our family, but Vlad and Lexi Logan, Wogan, they had a, a, a kid come from Vietnam, a young girl. Her name was Ann. And I, I just kidded off really good with her. I mean, I'm a Vietnam veteran, and I talked to her about mountains that were over there, Nui Ba Din, Nui Khao, and she understood, she knew them, been there. I talked about the city of Tainan and Kuchi, and she had been there. And so we had a lot of things in common that we were talking about. And I had just had a, bio, a study with her about baptism. She was going to get baptized at, at Easter time, but she had to go back to Vietnam because of this virus. And she wrote back to Vlad and Lexi and said that when she come to America, she knew about God. But when she went home, she had a relationship with Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? Is that not God pouring out his blessing upon us? Is not God expanding our border, our territory? Is not the hand of God there out in front of us? And now we got a missionary, not only in Germany, but now we have a missionary from our church that's over there in Vietnam. 
And this past, uh, earlier this month, February the 28th, we had our 29th annual Men's Boys Wild Game Feed. And uh, 29 years we've done this. The first time they met together, they met out here in this fellowship hall. I don't know, just a handful of people, maybe 15, 20 people, men and boys that met out there. This year at the Men's Boys Wild Game Feed, we met with almost 300 men and boys. And I was able to preach at that particular uh, time. And I gave an in, preached the gospel, told people about how they could be saved, how their lives could be revolutionized and changed, how that God died for them, how that he bled for them, how that, his, that he became their sin on the cross for them, how without the shedding of his blood there'd be no forgiveness of sins, that he not only did he die for them, but he was buried and he went to a grave and he rose again. And I gave an invitation for men to trust Christ as their Savior. And 40 men leaped to their feet to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that something that God just blessed me, blessed the church that way, that he expanded our border, that his hand was out there in front of us? Now we have 40 guys that do not come to this church that are scattered all over the place that are brand new Christians making an impact in the churches and in the community where they live. Isn't that amazing? And you know what else? In the 18 years since I've come here, every single year bar none, we've seen people come to know Jesus as their Savior. We've seen people baptized every single year. Every year there are some churches, some Baptist churches that go 10 years and never see anybody get saved. And But God has blessed us. He has poured out his blessing upon us. He's enlarging our borders. His hand is out there before us, and great things are taking place here in our fellowship. Our Sunday school classes are bulging with children. It's amazing. This past deacon's meeting, the deacon said that, that we needed to get somebody else to help out in children's church because there are so many little kids running around in children's church that are there taking part in children's church that we need more help in those places. Our Sunday schools are bulging, our children's church is bulging, Joanna is doing really great. I mean, God is doing great things. He's blessing us. He has poured out his spirit upon us. He's enlarged our border. His hand is going out there before us. And those are the spiritual things. Think of all the things that have happened around here that are physical things. I can remember when we were thinking about a parking lot and that parking lot out there was just a pile of sand and dirt and, 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 and we drove in every week and there were chuck holes out there and ladies were walking in getting mud on their toes. And I stood up here at this pulpit and I gave a challenge that we should build a parking lot and a man that I had never met before, maybe I shook his hand when he came into church that morning, came up to me and shook my hand and said, I'll play the first $20,000 if you can get people to be of it, I will match the first $20,000. I thought to myself, you better get your pen ready, buddy. And with one week, we had that $20,000 and we started doing that parking lot out here in the front. A couple of years later, we decided we would do the trail side parking lot. And there we looked at our budget and we looked at the money that we had saved up and we thought, well, we can get it all right out of there. And so the church voted to take it out of the savings. That was on a Sunday. On Tuesday, we got a check in the mail, a cashier's check from we don't even know who it came from that paid completely for that parking lot. Is not God blessing us? Is not God pouring out his blessing upon us? Is he not broadening our territory? Is his hand not out there in front of us? Over and over and over those things happen. And I've told people around here, man, you know, this church is a healthy church because ministries just spring up. You know, some churches, pastors have to work all the time thinking about this thing to do and that thing to do and trying to encourage people to get involved with things he's thinking. Not this church. This church, those ministries just spring up with people. I can remember when a couple came and asked me about a, an Easter egg hunt. And I, I think they might have come with a little bit of fear and intimidation because Baptist preachers aren't too big on Easter egg hunts and bunnies. But I said, you go right ahead and you have that. And that thing has grown, I think, last year we had around two, three hundred kids out here hunting Easter eggs all over on our property. We handed out Bibles and prizes and tracts and all kinds of things to kids. God is blessing us. He's blessed us. He's expanded our border. His hand is out there in front of us. God is doing great things amongst us. The 4th of July parade. Here's a good testimony. There was a lady that came to this church, she and her husband, and they're still coming to this church, and they're, they're down snowboarding right now, but they're coming up. They're going to join the church, I believe, this spring when they get up here she came up to me after they'd come for about a year and she said you know why we started coming to this church I said well no I, I don't really know why why that was and and she said it was that fourth of July parade she said any church that could have a float where old people middle-aged people young adults teenagers and children are all involved in that thing has got to be a church that we go to and so they were here and they're staying here, and now they're going to join the church. Isn't that marvelous? Isn't that God blessing us? Isn't he expanding our border? Isn't he causing great things to happen? Isn't his hand out there before us? Oh, my, it's so. 
We have a Sunday night Bible study, not now because of this virus, but we had started a Sunday night Bible study a few months ago, and it's interesting, two men started it, and Joe was, when he teaches, he's over at uh, Lundgren's, at Kinney's, and then Kinney hosts, and, and uh, uh, Joe teaches. But the next time, they will go over to Joe's house, Joe will host, and Kinney will be the teacher. And it's growing, more people coming all the time. God is pouring out his blessing. His borders are, our borders are being expanded. His hand is out there in front of us, and God is doing great things. It is amazing. I believe that's absolutely amazing. Today, even today, as I preach to you, God has brought us into the 21st century, hasn't he? I mean, it's being screamed to you. And it's, you're getting it out there in cyberspace, and we're going to continue to do this. We're hooking it up, and we're going to continue to do this even after this virus is all over with. And so the gospel is being streamed out into our community to all kinds of people and out there into cyberspace to who knows how far. God is blessing us. He's expanding our border. His hand is going before us, and, we're, and God is doing great things with us. Look at that prayer again. It says in it says in for. Also, to keep him from harm, that it might not pain him, to keep him from evil. And I, I could testify to you that I know for a fact that God has kept us from harm, kept us from evil. I don't know how many times we've been pruned in these 18 years, but it's been a few times. And, and God has just gotten people that were there that might have caused some trouble out of our way. You know, and we, in this side of heaven, we will never know how many times God stood in on our behalf. And, and caused something to happen, or God us, swerved us away from one pitfall or another pitfall in our life. Surely, God has answered this prayer in my life and in this church's life, and he wants to answer it in your life. If you want to have miracles taking place in your life on a regular basis, then you start praying the prayer of Jabez. You call out to God and ask God to bless you and to bless you really big that he would expand your border, that he'd give you a bigger plate, that his hand would go out there before you, and that he would keep you from harm, and God will bless that, and you will see miracles taking place in your life. What are you going to do with what the Lord has laid on your heart? And if you're here, if you're listening to this, and you do not know Jesus as your Savior, I'm telling you, today is a day of salvation for you. God has called you to listen to this, that you might know that Jesus died for you, that he was buried for you, that he took your place on that cross, substituted for you, and rose again. What are you going to do with the Lord and what he has said to you today? Let's pray together. Our Father, again, we want to tell you that we love you. We thank you, God, for your love to us. We thank you, God, for what you're doing amongst us. We thank you, God, for your great blessing uh, for us as a church. We thank you, Father, for the way in which you've expanded our border. We just can't praise you enough, God, for your hand getting out there in front of us. And, oh, Lord, we thank you that you kept us from the evil. And the old devil roams about like a roaring lion. He'd kill us if he could. But for your omnipotent hands, God, being around us, that would be the case with us. We would be destroyed like many other churches across our land. But you have protected us. And we praise you and thank you for it. I pray now, Lord, as the ladies sing and as people ponder what, what's taken place this morning, what they have listened to, that there would be people out there that would get saved and there would be Christians that would make a commitment to pray the prayer of Jabez on a regular basis, and we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. I Oh.
Jesus, I... 